Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming to the Stationers' Annual Archive event, one of the highlights of the company's year. I'm sorry that we're meeting only virtually tonight, and so miss the usual mingling, chatting, and what our clerk, Giles Fagan, customarily refers to as a substantial buffet. But we hope the cultural and intellectual content of the evening will match that of pre-COVID years, and we look forward to a plague-free evening sometime in the future. I'm Gordon Johnson, an historian and past chairman of Cambridge University Press. As a liveryman, I sit on the Library and Archives Committee, where my colleagues, led by Sarah Maherta, the chair, and the company's archivist, Dr. Ruth Frendo, enjoy preparing for this event and bringing to life for our fellow stationers and guests a glimpse of England's cultural heritage in diverse and perhaps unexpected ways. The archive is an extraordinarily rich source for the history of printing, publishing, the underlying business and the many ways in which information and ideas are created disseminated and conserved. The Stationers Archive is huge in scope and of national importance. The archive evening was conceived by the distinguished honorary archivist emerita Robin Myers. She wanted to show the company and its friends what remarkable things can be discovered from these unique records that stretch back into the 16th century and shed light on the company's lively range of activities in the 21st. Tonight's programme about the English stock has been devised by Professor Ian Gadd. The English stock, founded in 1603 to cash in on printing, the controversial, disruptive and cutting edge technology of the day, was the company's own publishing house and was for more than a century the largest most successful, richest and most powerful publisher in the country. Ian is Professor of English Literature at Bath Spa University. His primary centuries of study are the 16th to the 18th. He is both bibliographer and book historian, particularly interested in the ways in which printed texts were produced and circulated and the economics behind the book trade but he also has form as a critical editor of literary and non-literary texts. The company formed the subject of Ian's doctoral research and he's published extensively on its history, not least in volume one of the great history of Oxford University Press, which he also edited. He is among many other things, editor of the new Cambridge edition of the works of Jonathan Swift and with Dr. Peter Blaney, is preparing a scholarly edition of one of the archive's most important records, the material bound up in Liber A. Ian will introduce our panelists, Helen Smith, Joseph Saunders and Richard Bowden, who with Ian will each talk on their chosen topic for about 10 or 15 minutes. Then Dr. Frendo will encourage you to visit the virtual exhibition which she has curated to accompany this evening's talk. I will return to chair the discussion and the master, the Right Reverend Stephen Platten, will bring the evening to a close at around 7.30. Although as our gratifyingly large audience you will remain muted and invisible throughout the evening, you are encouraged to send in questions and comments via the Q&A button. It's helpful if you wish to direct a question to a particular speaker, you make that clear when submitting it. And now over to you, Ian. Thank you very much, Gordon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, as Gordon said, I'm Ian Gadd, and I'd like to welcome you uh, to this evening's talks, all of which, as you know, will focus on the English stock, that is the joint stock publishing venture uh, 
established and managed by the stationers company from 1603 until 1961. It's hard to understate the importance of the English stock on the fortunes in both senses of the company or its members, but the uh, full history is long and complex and we can only offer you uh, a few perspectives uh, this evening. I'm just going to uh, share my screen briefly so you can see our lineup for uh, this evening. You should all have received by email a copy of the two page handout accompanying uh, tonight's talks. This provides you with a very simple uh, overview of the stock's foundation, its structure and management, as well as a list of key archival records, a short chronology and suggested uh, further reading and should hopefully help you as you listen to our speakers. And I also strongly recommend the accompanying digital exhibition curated by the company's archivist uh, Ruth Frendo that Gordon mentioned a few moments ago. The talks have been decided, uh, designed to provide different ways of approaching and understanding the stock's history and impact uh, through the experiences of individuals as well as the company itself. The talks, as you can see, are ordered in chronological order, taking us from uh, the decades immediately before the establishment of the stock through to its dissolution in the 20th century. And as Gordon said, we will be holding questions over to the end when I hand back to Gordon. Our first speaker tonight is uh, Helen Smith, Professor of English Literature at the University of York and author of Grossly Material Things, Women and Book Production in Early Modern England, published in 2012. And her paper tonight draws directly on that research uh, to explore the roles of stationers widows in the early history of the English stock and is entitled Money at the Margins, Widows and the English Stock, 1565 to 1680. Helen, I will hand over to you. Thank you very much, Ian. And I'll just share my screen as well. Uh, sorry, there we go. Um, so thank you very much indeed to Gordon and Ian for their introductions um, and to uh, Ian, Ruth, Lucy um, and of course the Stages Company Clark for all the work that's gone in to organising this evening and especially for the wonderful online exhibition and, and innovation that I hope will extend far beyond um, this contemporary moment. Um, as Ian says, I'm going to talk for just a few minutes about women's engagements with the English stock over a period of about a century. My own scholarly interest is in the period uh, surrounding the, last, the latter years of the 16th century and the first half of the 17th century. One second, and I'll also see if I can reduce the background noise. Uh, oh, I can't find my mute button, sorry. Anna, quiet. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to offer a systematic overview of my sources, um, partly because, uh, as Ian notes in his very helpful handout, we don't have continuous records relating directly to the English stock before about 1644, though there are important individual documents and mentions prior to that historical moment. The stock's early history is much more fragmentary and it needs to be pieced together. It was done very effectively by Cyprian Blagden and hopefully Blagden's work will be updated, corrected and expanded by Peter Blaney as he moves forward with his own tremendous and detailed history of the stationers company, which I'm sure will cast some of what we think we know in an entirely new light. So I have given you a moment of asking what is an English stock anyway? Uh, this is really the question, uh, I suppose, bringing me to the nagging question that may have been there for those of you who were scrutinising our titles closely. If the English stock was formally established in 1603, why is Helen's opening date 1565? I will come to the answer to that question in just a moment, but first of all, I wanted to refer again to Ian's really helpful handout and to say that the English stock was formally established in 1603 thanks to letters patent from James VI and I. It was, as we've been said, a joint stock company, meaning that its stock was owned in, 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 um, in shares by shareholders who received a portion of the profits if and when they were realised. So it is, in one sense, a precursor of John Lewis, uh, if we want to think of it in those terms, at the end of the 16th century. The stock gathered together important patents or privileges. Those were essentially the rights to print a certain class of text, with school books, almanacs and the Psalter first, uh, foremost among them. So the stock had the right to print those kinds of text, 
and it made money from doing so, a small portion of which was distributed as charity, but also sometimes the stock was used to support struggling stationers in other ways, giving them the work of printing for the company of stationers, so that, that stationers could be escorted through the stock, um, both through actually being given a portion of the dividends, uh, a small portion of the dividends, but also through being given the opportunity to engage in printing and undertake work for the company. So Ian has given really helpful detail about all of this on the handout, and I wanted to give you only a couple of examples of what printing for the stock might look like. This lovely item is writing tables with a calendar uh, printed for the company of stationers at some point after 1625. You can see that other uh, printed waste has been used to wrap this book and bind up this set of erasable wax tables, a really handy uh, notebook for anyone who wanted to have it in their pocket and take erasable notes as they went around the streets. And here we have a couple of the core elements of the English stock. Uh, Thomas Langley's A New Almanac and Prognostication, that's Langley 1636. And also I wanted to throw in uh, from the very end of the period I'm looking at, uh, The Woman's Almanac by Mary Holden, so that I could bring in here a woman author, uh, a really fascinating medical almanac, um, and that sense of the different ways in which women engaged with print culture, uh, including unfortunately being the subject of really terrible woodcuts on occasion. Um, but I also want to think, I suppose, about women's longer term roles with the company. Women were involved with the stations company from its inception and indeed before its inception. So women in Paris and Antwerp were printing books for the English market from the 1520s onwards. Elizabeth Pickering, the widow of Robert Redman, was the first English woman to print under her maiden name. Uh, and it's an example of one of her books that you can see in my image on the slide here. Um, her close engagement with the stationers through several marriages is charted by Barbara Kreps in an invaluable microhistory of Pickering's family and community. And you'll see in the quotation on this slide that women, uh, that widows routinely inherited their husband's copy, that is, the text that their husbands had registered for printing. Such copies as be peculiar for life to any person free of this company shall not be granted to any other, but remain to the widow of such freeman as long as she shall be the widow of a freeman of this company, forgive my typo, or be married to any freeman or brother of the said company. So that sense in which women's engagement with the company was real right from its beginning and important right from its beginning, but also tied very much to their marital status and their role in passing on copy from uh, between uh, their husbands, uh, their sons and future husbands as well. Some widows quickly sold or bequeathed the copies that they inherited, but a good number kept them on and continued in the printing business. And that dynamic carried forward into the English stock. As Ian noted on his handout, widows could continue to hold their husband's shares and draw dividends so long as they did not remarry outside the company. So in 1644, the earliest year for which the list of dividends survives, over a quarter of those who were drawing down dividends were widows. They were a really important source um, of income and support for some of those dividends, but also that although women didn't have a strong voice in actually dictating the terms of the stock, they were a very substantial presence in terms of the people who benefited from it and uh, contributed to it. And that brings us, I suppose, to the theme of charity and community, the way in which the stock was part of the stationer's tremendous concern for its members and their well-being um, in certain ways. I've got a couple of examples, a book, The Displaying of the Papish Mass, uh, by the ever popular Thomas Beckham, printed by Anne Griffin. Uh, and because of the pandemic, I wasn't able to get a good copy from a library, so I apologise that this picture is taken from a site called 192 Puritan Wall Murals. So if you do want a Puritan Wall Mural, you know where you can go. The book is accompanied uh, by a complicated story that there isn't time to go into, but Griffin was taking advantage of a company policy that allowed poorer stationers to reprint works whose copyholders had died. The stationers permitted her to print this book on condition that upon the finishing of an impression she should pay to the use of the poor at the discretion of this court. It's an interesting example of that dynamic whereby the stationers both used charity to enable people to engage in work and then used the profits from that work in order to extend and further their charitable endeavours. And the second image I'm giving here is in the online exhibition. Some of the payments made by the stock in the 17th century are recorded in the company's poor book, which has also been very usefully edited. And these pages, which we've pulled together for the exhibition from 1613, note a number of payments to the widows of company members, showing how the stock helped to sustain the widows and orphans, the families of stationers, even after their deaths. Now, the last example I want to give is of a couple of examples of women printing the, printing the Psalms, uh, stories that bring a little bit of personality to my tale. 
I apologize again that this is a slightly odd illustration to draw on. It's a very beautiful, uh, it's detail from a very beautiful late 17th century gold tooled binding on a Psalter. The Psalter was printed for the company by Thomas Langley, and I've included, sorry, by Thomas, by John Leggett, sorry, and I've included it here um, because it was also inscribed by a young woman called Abigail Guildford in 1666. So evidence there too of a woman reader, as well as the women stationers and women authors that have come into the equation so far. In, the, in early 1645, the struggling widow Mrs Badger petitioned to be allowed to print some sheets of the Psalter as she'd done in the past. She was allowed to do so, she taking care it be well done. A sense here of the way in which a widow was understood to be responsible for the quality of what came out of her printing house and to invest caution and care in the work of printing for the company of stationers. And uh, perhaps my favourite, Anne Griffin, if you haven't picked that up already, was fined in 1636, which was definitely a bad year for her, for printing a book of psalms for the English stock with so large a margin that they cannot be joined to any other book. Now, there are no marginal annotations in the copies of the psalms printed by Griffin and her husband and later her son, and so I think this must mean that it was an issue of size and shape, that she had printed something outside the bounds of what was anticipated a book might look like, so that it could not be joined together, as psalms so often were, with other books like the New Testament. These seem to me to be nice examples that bring the humans of the English stock into view, that illustrate, albeit in brief, how the English stock bound together communities, even if those communities produce books that could not always be bound together themselves, how the profit margins of the company were wrapped up sometimes with the errant margins of an early modern woman's printing house. Thank you. Thank you, Helen, uh, and well done, given the uh, uh, distractions. Uh, uh, you have a small person pestering you, I have a small dog pestering me, so apologies, uh, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the perils, this wouldn't happen in the hall. Um, so uh, our second speaker tonight is uh, uh, Joe Saunders, who is a PhD student of uh, Helen's at the University of York, researching, you will be not that surprised to hear, the wills of members of the English book trade uh, from 1557 through till 1666. Um, and so, as his paper suggests, he will be focusing on what these wills can tell us about the impact of the stock on the uh, lives and careers of individual stationers and is entitled Bequeathing Shares, the English Stock in Stationers' Wills, 1603 to 1641. Excellent, thank you Ian for that introduction. I'm just going to share my screen. Excellent. So you should all have the screen there in front of you. Um, uh, thank you, Ian, uh, Richard, Lucy, Ruth, uh, everyone else who's organised this event. Um, it, it really is a pleasure to be here with you, uh, even if it is virtually. Um, so I'm going to share some research, as Ian said, uh, on my PhD, which focuses uh, on stations, wheels. Um, and this part is going to focus particularly between the inception of the stock, 1603, uh, up to the outbreak of uh, civil war, so I'm going to cut short in 1641. Um, this has been described as a time of strength, when the stock was in its idealised form and the company was arguably at the peak of its powers. In these four decades, the stock secured a central position within the finances of the company and within the book trade. However, as Helen has shown, the stock cannot be reduced just to a balance of accounts. It very much existed in the minds of company members as inherently bound up with the texts that constituted it, and also for the benefit of the poor and for its social and economic value to shareholders. The humanity of the stock in its first decades is what strikes me when looking through their wills, and that's the sense that I'd like to impart to you all today. So, just to say a bit about the wills that I'm using. Now, these are from the Prerogative Court of Canterbury, the highest probate court in Southern England and where almost all stationers' wills from this period were proved. Um, I'll put my email at the end if anyone would like details of 17th century probate jurisdictions in more detail, um, but I'll spare you today, it'll be quite dense. Uh, there were 100 stationers' wills, a nice round number, um, that I found registered at Canterbury between 1603 and the end of 1641. There are some general observations about the direction of the stock after death 
death that I'd like to make. Essentially, that its value could be fluid. While in the first instance, stock was bequeathed to widows, it also went to sons where it could, and that is to sons within the company. That stock could always be transferred to widows, I suspect, encouraged the passing of shares to widows over sons. From at least 1613, the second request we have, uh, it was understood that unmarried, only unmarried widows, uh, or not remarried widows, could hold stock. I'm not sure how long this was before it became widely known, as it was only in uh, 1612 that another bequest had ignored this uh, condition. In the absence of widows or sons, shares were left to a wide range of people, such as brothers, cousins, uh, and wider uh, degrees of kin. Uh, and this was done not as shares, but into smaller sums of money um, tokened off. Uh, and the, the range of bequests show how the, the stock could be bequeathed, um, both as a, an important part of a business to a widow or son who's intended to carry on, um, but also purely financially, you know, dispersed, as I say, into token sums uh, fluidly. So I'd like to think about the bequests in two ways. Uh, first of all, in numbers. Um, in these 100 wills were 16 bequests of English stock, uh, which may seem low, um, but it is a reasonable percentage um, compared to similar proportions of trade item. Uh, and only about a third of English people made a will at this time, uh, incidentally about the same proportion as today. Um, so the stock was transferred mostly outside of wills. Um, so what we have here are um, only a minority, but do give us some interesting perceptions, I think. So on screen, um, I've put the dates where the shares were bequeathed uh, in, in these wills, in these hundred wills. The frequency of bequests, as you can see, grew over time uh, towards 1641. Uh, in the 45 wills that we have from 1603 to 1621, there were just six bequests compared to 10 bequests uh, in the 55 wills from 1622 to 1641. You can see there was almost a decade between the exception of the stock in 1603 and 1612, where there was just one bequest of shares. And then we begin to see them more regularly. Now, arguably this was generational in part. Uh, it took time for the first holders to die and pass on their shares. It also may have been cultural with a sense that it wasn't important enough to include shares in the early years in a will. Even after we begin to see them more frequently from 1612, the bequests are irregular. And there are bequests in 1621 and 1634 that sit within periods uh, without other bequests. And we see many bequests in 16, uh, or two bequests in 1625 and three in 1638 uh, when there was periods of plague. So stepping back to look at the entire 100 wheel sample, I think we can see some reason in this irregularity. Um, in the early period, um, where there were fewer uh, bequests of shares. Um, actually, there were, there were quite a few wills um, in between that. Uh, and I think this reflects that uh, stock was bequeathed uh, in a lower proportion overall. Um, in the, the 1620 onwards, um, I think wills became a, a more important way of stationers to bequeath their shares. Uh, and we can see this as actually uh, later on, uh, there were fewer um, wills um, out of this that, that aren't represented in, in stock. So um, a perceptible change, um, but perhaps not significantly shown in the numbers themselves. Uh, in the second part of my talk, I'd like to move on to looking at uh, the way that station has viewed wills, um, particularly looking at, at language uh, and how this shows perhaps a shifting understanding of what the stock actually meant to them. Now I've got on the screen here, the bequest of uh, Rafe Newbury in April 1607. And this is the earliest stock bequest I found just four years after inception. Uh, I won't read it all out to you, um, although again, you can email me if you'd like a copy of this or the transcript. Um, and it says, in essence, um, I have a stock of book in Stationers Hall that belongs unto me as the remainder of the Book of Martyrs, referring to, and I quote, Master Day and Master Sarah's privileges for printing of books my will and mind is that my stock and parts in Stationers Hall shall be sold by the discretion and assistance of the master and wardens. He goes on to say that he would like the dividends divided into four parts. One for the poor of the company, 
One, for a stock to be employed to set poor children in Bridewell on work. One, for the poor children of Christ Hospital. And one, for the poor of the parish of St Bride's. Now, after the stock is addressed in this first bequest in 1607, um, there are two things that I'd like to think about as we look at bequests following on in the coming decades. First, we see here the stock referred to as actual books and the Book of Martyr and the day in Sarah's privileges uh, were some of the founding elements in the stock, as you'll see in Ian's handout. Uh, as this part of the stock's history and identity fell into the past, uh, this way of referring to it was no more. It was called from here on part of the stock, money from the stock, or simply just the stock. All but one of the bequests up to 1625 specifically mention the, the hall as where the stock is, showing that there's a physical place um, that they have in mind. Uh, and this changes, uh, and only half of the bequests from 1625 to 1641 do the same. And I think there's a perception here uh, shifting uh, with the stock becoming something in its own right, uh, moving away from, bot from books um, towards shares. The other thing I'd like to highlight is that Station has viewed the stock as charitable, um, but in a range of ways. Uh, and this charitable function to the core of the company, as we will see and have seen, uh, was a part of the, the setting up of the stock in the first place. Uh, and you can see in Ruth's brilliant virtual exhibition accounts relating to this function. We see in the bequest above that the stock was set aside for charity in four portions beyond the company, and that is to hospital, to Parrot to the local parish. From here on, we see the stock bequeathed directly within the company in a, a range of ways. Um, so, for example, the second stock bequest in 1612 gave £20 from the stock, which was to be lent out by the master and wardens to young freemen of the company as a three year loan. In 1613, a stock bequest gave £50 to the company to be employed at their own discretion. And this kind of charitable request to the company uh, is repeated further, um, although uh, two of the most amusing that I found uh, in 1630, Humphrey Lowndes uh, loans, uh, I suspect, uh, gave his £20, which was to the company from his stock, um, in order to ease through the fact that he wanted his other £300 of shares to carry on paying out to his grandchildren after his death. In 1641, John Smethick, gave 20 pounds to the company, seemingly to ease his son's way from his half to full yeomanry part. So over time, the stock seems to have become still about charity, but, but maybe more of a clear economic benefit to shareholders and perhaps also a signifier of status. It seems to have bound the community or at least the elite within the community and we have a sense that it was worth more than its monetary value. In that same bequest I just mentioned uh, by John Smethick in 1641, uh, he tells his son in no uncertain terms that he shall not at any time hereafter mortgage, sell, assign or set over his stock. Uh, strong words from a father to uh, a son who may have seen financial value uh, in the short term rather than the long term. Um, I have here as well an extract from the will of Sarah Wright White, uh, the only woman in this sample to describe herself as a stationer in her will and the only woman to bequeath stock. This to me supports the idea that the stock became quite quickly an inherent part of being a stationer. We also see in wills of the 1620s and 30s the treasurer of the English stock Edmund Weaver um, often being asked to oversee or execute a will and that is to sort of set about bringing debts and, and seeing that bequests were, were undertaken. Uh, and this was a, a very important set of roles uh, within a community and, and for people within the company. And we see him do this again and again, more so than anyone else. And I think this shows as well the, the value that, that somebody involved so inherently within the English stock could hold within the company. So the growing frequency and manner of requests show how the stock was quickly established as a key financial instrument in the trade community. For the richest, it was also a social entity with a value beyond the purely economic. The quests of stock in wills give a sense that it was a binding force within the community. And we also see a sense over time 
and different interpretations perhaps between people uh, depending on age um, and over the course of years. The stock had a power that originated with valuable texts that formed it and the dividends that it paid, uh, but it was also enmeshed into the social fabric in a more intangible way. So thank you for listening. Um, I've got my email there, um, so please do uh, get in touch if you have any questions uh, that we can't answer tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, uh, I should have mentioned uh, um, just before Joe started that uh, some of you in the chat uh, hadn't received the handout, uh, so I have shared that as a link. And unlike Helen, uh, Helen, Joe, and Richard, there will be no slides for my particular presentation. Uh, so I, I urge you to go and look at the handout instead, rather than at uh, 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 my face as I'm reading uh, um, uh, my talk today. Um, given the the two papers that you've heard so far, um, that they focus very much on the individual history of the English stock, I want to offer instead a kind of long view. My own research um, has focused very much on the company as an organization uh, over its uh, history. And I want to reflect on the impact of the stock on the company's character and behavior. But before I uh, um, do so, I want to make an argument about the stock's foundation in 1603 which was, I'd say, in many ways, the logical and possibly the inevitable conclusion of two key developments from the previous century. First, from the early uh, 16th century, the use of uh, printing privileges in the English book trade, that is the granting of commercial monopolies to individuals to protect the publishing rights uh, for a specific title or a specific genre of work. That's the first uh, element in this particular, uh, uh, um, that, that I'm arguing led to the English stock. The second development was uh, uh, something that all of you will know, uh, which is the incorporation of the Stationers Company in 1557, because that enabled the company to extend that model of protecting publishing rights to all of its members. Because famously, the 1557 charter limited printing in the whole of England to just two groups of people, those who had printing privileges direct from the Crown and then members of the Stationers Company. And it was the latter that prompted the company to create the Stationers Register as a way of managing the publishing rights of its, uh, uh, or the individual publishing rights of its members. Also, as many of you will know from your own professional experience, incorporation created a new legal entity, which meant that the stationers company could now go to court in its own right. It could enter into contracts, it could uh, uh, own property, and crucially, it could be granted printing privileges. And that uh, uh, was not unprecedented. The University of Cambridge had been granted the right to print, quote, all manner of books in 1534, and a similar right was granted to the University of Oxford under Queen Elizabeth I. Crucially, both those grants and the English stock were able to take advantage of another key characteristic of a corporation, namely its immortality. So when in 1603, the company was able to bundle together as a new grant, existing printing privileges for primers, salters, psalms and almanacs, and thus create English stock, it did so knowing that its rights would never expire. The Stationers Company was not the only livery company to figure out that there were advantages for a company to establish some kind of commercial enterprise on behalf of its members. But the success of the English stock, not least when compared to other stocks established by Stationers Company, that success is very striking. Part of the explanation, I think, lies in how the stock was integrated into the company, not just in its management structure, but crucially, and we've seen hints of that from uh, uh, Joe's paper, how its benefits were, at least in principle, broadly shared. The stock provided welfare for poor uh, members and dividends for widows, as uh, um, Helen has mentioned. Printers could be provided with regular work and the number of shareholders, 105 to start with, then 125, meant that at least in those early years, 
shares were available to a significant proportion of the company. Thus, everybody in the company had some kind of stake in the success of the stock, even if it was simply a belief that they too might one day own a share. And that, in turn, meant that the success, uh, that success in the company, in terms of promotion and influence, became closely tied up to securing a share. And so, uh, um, as Joe has shown, Station has paid close attention to how shares were divided up, and passed on and were uh, uh, um, dissolved in the capital uh, then uh, paid on. And it is a shame that we don't yet have a database for all the shareholders from 1603 through to 1961, although the surviving records make that perfectly possible to recreate. And I will say that the late Michael Turner, my own uh, PhD supervisor, did a great deal of work in this area as part of developing his biographical database, uh, the London Book Trades, but a separate data set of shareholders would allow us to understand more fully how important the English stock must have been for the careers of individual members of the book trade. For new members, a potential investment opportunity that generally returned a dividend of around 12.5% must have been very attractive. In the decade that the stock was established, so around 1603, the company was freeing about 24 stationers a year. In the following decade, that average leapt to 34 a year, and it would remain between 30 and 45 a year for the next two centuries. The number of livery, or the size of the livery, mushrooms. At the time of the stock, it probably numbered several dozen, but by the 1680s, it was over 170, and a century later, it was in the low 300s. Such growth, though meant dwindling opportunity. And by the end of the 17th century, only liverymen stood a chance of securing one of the 125 shares. And during the 18th century, the company did periodically increase the number of shareholders so that by 1770, there were 229 shares, but it was never enough to meaningfully redress the imbalance between supply and demand. In addition, the stock encouraged members to remain active in the book trades as only they could hold shares, ensuring a homogeneity, homogeneity that through this period that contrasted with many other livery companies. And also it provided valuable pensions for widows. In 1644, a quarter of all shares were held by widows. And during the 18th century, it was not unusual for the majority of assistant shares, that's the very top shares, each worth £320 and returning £40 a year. It was not unusual for a majority of those to be held by widows. The stock did not just change the relationship between the company and individual member, it also transformed the company's decision maker. Decision making. To quote Richard Atkins, a very hostile critic of the company in the mid 17th century, it created an under company, that is a company within a company. And the fact that assistants always made up the majority of the committee managing the stock meant that, to quote Cyprian Blangdon, the uh, uh, um, stationers company historian, the borderline between company affairs and stock affairs, between company income and stock income, between company property and stock property was always wavy and at times indistinguishable, even to the officials involved. And it is very telling, for example, that at the very first meeting of the Court of Assistance following the Great Fire of London and the destruction of Stationers Hall, four out of the five agenda items concerned the stock. The foundation of the English stock meant that the company, like many of its members, had now become a publisher. And so just like them, it needed to protect its rights. When threatened, its tactics were to use a mixture of financial sweeteners and aggressive legal action. And this can be seen particularly in the case of the two universities who, as I've mentioned, uh, um, who had broad based privileges that would seem to allow for the printing of any work, regardless of whether those works were already protected by another privilege. There were periods of legal conflict between the company and the universities, most notably with Oxford in the 1670s and 80s. But for the most part, between the 1630s and the 1770s, the company paid substantial sums 
to the universities to quote, forbear printing works that the company and a couple of other key privilege holders did not want the universities to publish. Famously in the 1770s, the company sought unsuccessfully to face down Thomas Carnan's challenge to its almanac monopoly. It was reputed to have offered Carnan 10,000 pounds to desist, which I think is entirely plausible given how lucrative the almanac, almanac market had become. Coming only a year after the principle of, of perpetual copyright had been overturned at law, Carnan's victory must have been a considerable shock for the company. Although as Richard will show in his talk, the uh, uh, actual impact was relatively minimal. Instead, the primary victims of Carnan's victory seem to have been the universities who had been relying on those annual payments for decades. And now with no legal monopoly to defend, the income ceased from London and the universities panicked, prompting a political campaign that eventually led them to securing a statutory right to an annual subsidy, an act of compensation that incidentally marks the start of state funding of the English higher education system. The English stock also, I think, explains another peculiarity of the company's history when compared to other livery companies. In 1559, so two years after uh, the incorporation, the company sought a confirmation of its charter from Queen Elizabeth, a very sensible move, not least because it had been incorporated by a Catholic monarch. But that was the only time it did so, unlike many other companies who routinely sought confirmations with each new monarch. Given that the rights embodied in the stock it depended on the company's incorporated status, I think there was a genuine fear that revisiting the latter could jeopardize the former. And in fact, the one exception to this, I think, proves the rule. When in 1684, all of London's livery companies had their charters revoked by James II, and the reason for that is a whole other story, the stationers' company secured a new charter in eight weeks flat. The next company to do so did so seven months later. Blagden suggests that the king was more worried about books than any other aspects of the London economy and that he said was why uh, uh, the grant was made so quickly. But I think a more plausible reason is that the company needed to make sure that its rights to the English stock were preserved and were preserved as quickly as possible. Similarly, in the months preceding the lapsing of the so-called Printing Act in 1695, which underwrote quite a lot of the company's authority by this period. The company was very fearful that this would usher in new legislation that would challenge its publishing rights. In fact, no less a figure than John Locke, the philosopher, ridiculed the stock for monopolizing the publishing of classical authors. But thankfully for the company, the stock survived unscathed and essentially unaffected by the time the Copyright Act came in in 1710. The stock though was not just a source of valuable income for a select group of stationers, nor was it a cause, or nor was it just a cause of perpetual anxiety for the company, because it also changed the company's financial capacity and its priorities. It funded the purchase of the hall in the early 17th century, uh, on the same um, spot where the uh, current hall uh, uh, stands. It underwrote the company's investment in various citywide ventures, such as uh, uh, in Northern Ireland and in North America. And on more than one occasion, it prompted the company to borrow money in order to ensure that it could meet its dividend payments uh, for that year. Crucially, all this, that financial strength, uh, um, that financial prioritization, um, the combination with the growth of members, that strengthened the company's economic and political power in the city. And by the second half of the 17th century, the company was already much larger and wealthier than its civic ranking of 47th would suggest. In fact, by 16, the 1680s, its livery was perhaps the 10th largest in London. This continued century, a period of contraction and weakening for most companies in London, but not for the stationers. And by the end of the century, the 18th century, 
the stationers company had become one of the most important livery companies in London. And to give you a sense of that, by, between 1785 and 1831, it supplied London's Lord Mayor on average every five years. The English stock is not the only factor in the general success of the stationers company between 1603 and 1780. But without it, I would argue the company would have looked and would have acted very different. Thank you very much. I will now pass on to uh, Richard, our final speaker, um, who is former senior archivist at Westminster City Archives and a former uh, consultant archivist uh, for the Howard D. Walden estate and the Portman, Est Portman estate. He has published numerous books and articles on London history, including contributing a chapter to Robin Meyer's History of the Stations Company from 1800 onwards. And his paper tonight will trace the successful endurance of the English stock in the aftermath of the Corn and Cart case, but also it will explain how 350 years after its foundation, the company came to the decision to wind it up. And I will be providing the, uh, uh, the slides, so I will... Uh, um, share my screen and hand over to Richard. Hello, the, the, the first slide, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about this, which is a fascinating story, actually, as, as I hope you'll, you, you'll see. This, this particular image is selected uh, because I think it shows you the scale of Almanac Day, which happened every November when all the almanacs were released from Stationers Hall for distribution all, <clears throat> all over the country. It's a little bit later in date th than that, but this was the process which always happened and it attracted this enormous crowd of people. If we go back to, um, if we start at 1800, more than 571,000 almanacs were being printed annually and well over 90% of them were sold, almost 516,000. By 1800, things had returned to normal. The English stock had recovered from the Conan dispute after Conan had taken the bold step of publishing his almanacs without stamp duty and undercutting the, the, the stationers seriously and even had succeeding in, in court on this issue. But after his death in 1788, the English stock simply bought up all his titles and carried on as before. Next slide, please. Now, most of these almanacs were copies of Old Moor, which is illustrated here, a, page, a title page and a page from the inside which I hope will give you an impression of what they represented. And the closest analogy which occurred to me was to think of it as, as people's smartphone of the day, because they, they, they could follow the uh, calendar and all the implications of it from their almanac. But, um, in 1828, the company came under a serious attack from Charles Knight of the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge, who accused them of exploiting the ignorance of the uneducated classes. And he denounced one of the almanacs, Poor Robin, as being actually obscene. And if you look at the, at the right hand image, you can see that it, it quotes different parts of, of the body fairly, fairly graphically, and it's all astrological, 
and Knight objected very strongly to the emphasis on astrology. The company wasn't terribly impressed with this criticism, although it did actually withdraw Paul Robin, but astrology stayed as part of the almanacs uh, until 1871. This was when it attracted a further attack in the form of the pamphlet and entitled Enter at Stationers Hall. This was an anonymous but very powerful piece of invective accusing the company of acting in the 16th century like the Spanish Inquisition and gagging the press. And it rather effectively turned Pope's aphorism, wretches hang that jury men may dine, into authors must pay that stationers may dine. <laughs> anyway, by 1870, the sales of almanacs had plummeted. Education had become compulsory, a big step, and almanacs were ne no longer able to perform what had been one of their main functions, which was entertainment. Just dropping back to the 1830s, they surmounted another major crisis when they'd been threatened by illegally produced almanacs, which were again being sold without paying stamp duty. This had been almost too much for the company to compete against. They had even been forced to approach the Chancellor of the Exchequer in person to beg his help, going to the length of saying that if nothing was done, they might have to stop publishing altogether. However, this extreme step did not have to be taken. Stamp duty was abolished, leading to an all-time record of almanac sales in 1839 of 694,000 and the English stock's top annual turnover figure, 12,401 pounds. Between then and 1847, the dividend went shooting up to 17%. However, these results could not be maintained. Although more than 20 titles were being published in 1871, the total number of almanacs sold had dropped to 250,000 and was still falling, despite the court playing a much more active role as well as the stock board in dealing with them. The stock board having previously always taken the lead in, in managing the, the, the stock. And then by 1895, another 25 years later, following the death in 18, 1893 of W.S.B. Woolhouse, who'd compiled Old Moore since the 1840s, the total number of sales was right down to 57,000. And this graph shows you what <clears throat> was, <clears throat> what, what, what had happened in, <laughs> in, in quite a dramatic way. And in fact, by 1900, the court seems to have accepted that the stock stays as a publisher were over and that it would have to look to investments as a source of income. But even then, it could not bring itself to tackle the admittedly complicated task of winding it up. This would involve seeking advice from the High Court. And so, remarkably, the English stock survived for another 50 years. Agreements were signed successively after that with Charles Letts and Castle to maintain some kind of momentum and a sheet almanac. The stationers carried on to 1941 with a diary and yearbook, which lasted until 1988. But the company's involvement with these was very much reduced. Instead, the company's attention turned towards rents and investments. Next slide, please. And here we have a pie chart showing 
what had happened to the um, investments, if we can move that, the uh, white one, are the, the, the blank one is rents, the uh, dotted one is investments, and the, the black one is the almanacs, which had completely shrunk away compared with 1900. Both rents and investments had always been among the stock's main activities and sources of income, but they were now increasingly so. For the next few years, the six properties between Ave Maria Lane and Stationers Hall Court. Next slide, please. Numbers 18 to 28, Ludgate Hill, were to play a particularly important role in the way things developed. That's these properties here, that's Ludgate Hill, and these are the ones which came into important play at this point. In 1900, they acquired number 22, which was demolished, rebuilt and let to Simpkin Marshall, who were up at the north of the site already. And in 1930, they acquired number 20. And then the, the war arrived and the whole area was of course flattened. But in 1949, the company took the opportunity to buy 24 to 28, that's these ones, capping this in 1952 by acquiring the last remaining property, number 18 on the corner. There's Ave Maria Lane and Stationers Court. So that they owned the whole of the block. The question then was what to do with this absolutely prime site, whether to sell, lease or, or develop it. However, it formed part of the entire Paternoster Square development, which was then um, being discussed at enormous length. And so it took another five years before any uh, planning consent came at the end of 1958. But by then, the company was disagreeing about what was to be done with it. The surveyors of the company wanted the stationers to develop the site, but the stock board, which it had, which it was decided should actually take this final crucial decision, fair enough, meeting in December 19. 58, rejected that plan and recommended selling it. So in March 1959, it went onto the market, priced at 285,000. A month later, it was sold to the <clears throat> Colonial Mutual Life Assurance Society Limited for the colossal and totally unexpected sum of £663,000. Well, you might have thought that this was the end of the story, but it, it, but it wasn't. Following a recommendation in January 1958, just before the sale, backed up by council's advice, it had been accepted that the English stock would have to be absorbed into the company. How this was to be done was far from clear. And then, after the sale, further reliable advice came up with the news that the proceeds of the sale actually belonged not to the company at all, but to the stockholders. There, there was a way around this, but, but it would involve a private act of parliament. And that, that there was an additional factor of compensating the stockholders. Discussion of this difficult issue and trying to find the fairest solution caused deep divisions during most of 1960. No dividend had been paid during the war. It was restarted in 1949 at two and a half percent, but after the sale, 
it returned to its original 12.5%, with an additional 37.5% as a special bonus payment. There were, there were now 25 court shares, 50 livery shares, and 100 yeomanry. To cut a long story short, which is, it, which is complicated, after various schemes had been suggested, the decision was taken to repay the existing stockholders with annuities of 64, 32, or 16 pounds respectively, depending on which type of shares they held, but with the critical difference that when any of them died, their share could go only to someone who joined the company before 1961, thus ensuring that the number of annuitants was gradually decreasing. Unfortunately, William Penman, next slide please, who had for some year and for some time been the company's treasurer, disagreed. He thought the stockholders should be given a great deal more by way of compensation. And he caused a very great division, which led to much argument within the company. But he never attracted much general support. However, when the company approached the House of Lords to obtain the necessary Act of Parliament, he went to the lengths of presenting a petition opposing it. He failed and simply increased the costs involved. But this was sadly at the expense of his career. He resigned as treasurer, which was very tragic because he had in fact made a very important contribution to the process of ending the, the, the stock. So the act finally became law in June 1961 including the creation of a new charitable fund. After all this turbulence, not quite the triumph it should have been, perhaps, but this English stock's extraordinary financial legacy was enough to take the company safely through the next few decades. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard, uh, and thank you to all our speakers. We, it's been a whistle-stop hour from uh, uh, 1603, or a bit before, uh, up to 1961, and in fact beyond, as, as Giles uh, Fagan, the, the, the new clerk, will uh, no doubt be able to uh, tell us. The 1961 fund is still an important part of the uh, uh, station as charitable uh, activities. Uh, and we've uh, um, ranged from Anne Griffin in the early 17th century all the way through to William Penman uh, in the uh, mid 20th century. Um, I am now uh, closing the parenthesis that I opened uh, about an hour ago and we'll pass back now to, to Gordon who will take us into our question and answer uh, session. Gordon. Thank you very much. Ian, and thank you to the, uh, the panellists, uh, to you for the very lovely broad sweep of, uh, of history of, of showing the impact of this publishing company that's a com uh, an institution within, uh, within the company. And it's, it's interesting that such, uh, a, as it were, a devolved bit of sovereignty should continue, as Richard has shown, to exert considerable influence, even after its main purpose uh, had come to an end in the 20th century, which was to publish books when it just became a sort of a rentier type of organization with investments and drawing uh, rents to, uh, to make up its sort of uh, funding. And of course, it was particularly fascinating that uh, we learned right from the 16th century uh, the, the role of, of women, uh, both as working sort of printers or as uh, supervisors or managers of printing houses, uh, and the role in which the profits from this uh, company 
uh, provided pensions for uh, for widows and opportunities for apprenticeships uh, and other charitable good works. But before we, so I invite people to uh, send in uh, their questions uh, now on the Q and A uh, chat button. And while we are waiting for them to come in, um, I'm going to turn to uh, to Ruth Frendo, who will tell us a little bit generally about the archive and about the virtual exhibition that she has curated for us. So Ruth. Okay, I just wanted to start by thanking the panelists. That was amazing. And it's always really special for me when I listen to and read research done on our archive collections, because we are incredibly fortunate to have such good collections. Um, we've also been very lucky in that many of our um, resources are actually digitized and they're available via this Adam Matthew digital um, product called Literary Print Culture. It is a subscription only resource but it's also available via the British Library and um, so once things reopen we hope that that will widen access still further um, and in the meantime I would encourage you to look at our website. We do have a special area for the archive um, where we give a few details about how you can access the archive, how you can contact me, um, and we do also have a little collection of useful web resources that are free to access and that you may, as researchers, find helpful when you're looking into um, print history and particularly the history of people working in the book trade in London and in Britain. Um, you also have my contact details and please do feel free to contact me with any questions and um, I will get to you as soon as I can <laughs> and finally just a little mention of our online exhibition. Usually when we have our physical events rather than virtual events we invite everybody to the hall and we put out some of our archive treasures for people to look at so as we couldn't do that this year we have at least provided a small digital um, collection. You can enter it via the landing page for the archive, and you'll see that each image can be clicked on and you'll have the expansion there. And um, so hopefully that will be of some use. Um, once again, thank you very much to the panel and to my colleagues in the Library and Archive Committee and to Gordon for doing such an excellent job of hosting this. Okay, um, I'm gonna hand back to Gordon now. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, Ruth. The, the, the very recent um, publication of the digital archive, which is in, in fact uh, uh, easily accessible uh, now, is a great service to anyone uh, who wants to follow up uh, points. It's very searchable um, and it's amazing the things you can find on it. Now we have a question from Martin Woodhead who, uh, who um, uh, asks, do we know who currently holds the rights to publish Old Moore's Almanac and how, how did they obtain that, that right? Who's the right person to answer that question, Ian? Uh, that feels like a very leading question in many ways, as, as if uh, uh, um, the company might look to us reassert its copyright. But uh, Richard, do you know what happened to Old Moore's uh, copyright? I'm afraid I don't. I, I'm sorry, I don't. I think it's still around. I can see on Amazon that it's currently published by W. E. Fulsham and Co. Limited, but how it got to them, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> can I just ask a very uh, general question, Ian, that uh, all of you might be able to participate, but from, from my uh, understanding, the, uh, the, the English stock is, if you like, uh, the name of a, of a publishing corporation. And what is particularly interesting about it is the way in which they obtain uh, in contemporary language uh, a rather ferocious uh, copyright to very popular um, in, in 
uh, in a sense, very popular works. So it, they're sort of tabloid publishers, really, aren't they? Um, the, 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 the main profit, profitability, comes from the, the almanacs, which range, as Richard shows, for, uh, uh, um, from you know, some single sheets to uh, these astrological, um, mysterious, superstitious uh, type uh, little booklets and diaries and calendars um, uh, to a really quite beautifully illustrated diary, that sort of stuff uh, as you get into the, into the 18th century. Um, that plus Salters, which is a small book that uh, has a large domestic sale, unlike say big Bibles that have very limited uh, domestic sale and very slow institutional sales because you're not, you know, a church is not gonna buy a new Bible every year, whereas a household might buy a new Psalter uh, reasonably frequently or, or buy it for uh, christenings and weddings and so on as, 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 as sort of gifts. So um, uh, the, the publishing at this sort of level through the, the 17th century in particular is an amazing way of generating enormous profits. Um, I see that Helen is poised, so I will call on her in a moment. But uh, um, uh, I think, I mean, I, I, tabloid. I mean, Gordon, you're a you're a liveryman of the company. Surely that, that, that it wouldn't that the company wouldn't 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 stoop so low. But I I think the first thing about the stock is that it is it's a mixture of of privileges or or, or uh, uh, publishing rights in there. Some of them um, are for very uh, um, ephemeral. Uh, works uh, very popular but also not long lasting like almanacs as, as uh, uh, um, one of the extraordinary things about almanacs is that we know they circulated in enormous numbers and yet in in the early period uh, very very few survive um, they were uh, not kept um, but in addition you had psalm books you had psalters they for a while they held the uh, 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 rights to fox's book of martyrs they had uh, um classical school books, English school books. So it was uh, um, law books for a little while. Uh, so it, it, the, the, the kind of mix of, 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 of rights was quite diverse. Uh, it wasn't the most uh, grand privileges, you know, the, 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 those of the uh, owned by the uh, King and Queen's printer, uh, which include Bibles of all sorts, um, but it was still uh, quite diverse. I think, one thing that was interesting about the stock, um, and I'm not an economic historian of, of the book trade, but one of the things is, uh, um, as I'm sure uh, all publishers to this day know, that if you have a, di a, a, uh, um, a diverse portfolio of titles, then that makes uh, uh, your uh, business a lot more robust and resilient than if you have just one or two uh, uh, um, key titles. And I think that that the company perhaps didn't know quite how long the stock would last, but actually it turns out that some of the elements, the almanacs, lasted for, for centuries, whereas other uh, um, particular uh, um, titles became less and less uh, important and less and less desirable. Helen, do you want to add anything about, particularly I think about around almanacs, but maybe also psalm books in, in, in the 17th century? That was what made me smi smile, I suppose, that the psalm books might be the, uh, the, the, the tabloid newspapers of the, <laughs> the, the late 17th, the early 17th century. Um, I think also that one of the interesting things that we didn't talk about today is the number of quarrels and squabbles that were around that foundation of the stock and that this was very much a process of negotiation and of attempting to lay claim to the stock and equally that people were um, willing to break the, those uh, rules and willing to break those regulations. So I think there's an interestingly dynamic history in the way in which the stationers company set up the stock um, and the way in which some people participated very enthusiastically and others perhaps attempted to um to, to countermand it or to, to work around the edges of the stock in certain ways perhaps which might also have its resonances with the tabloids <laughs> and i also think as richard will probably uh, uh add that by the 19th century the almanac uh market was so large as far as the stock was concerned that uh, when um, 
that became synonymous with the stock, I think. So, so uh, um, Richard's point about how almanacs became, uh, um, uh, the attitude to almanacs changed. I think that, that the, the, the close association between the almanac, the English stock and the stationers company, obviously they all had printed at stationers hall on the front, uh, um, really reinforced that. Richard, would you, would you uh, um, agree with that? Yes, very much so. I mean, I, I was struck by the introduction of the Education Act in 1870, which I think must have put, put the lid on things pretty effectively at that point and made, made people understand that, that really that this was a blind alley, probably. I think, I think Robin Myers has just made a very interesting um, observation that, of course, in this mix of, of publishing, um, you're not finding that the English stock is doing expensive, unsellable books. So, you know, as bibliophiles, we think of the 17th century in particular as an era in which printing plays into uh, the most wonderful, beautiful books uh, containing uh, lots of wonderful illustrations, uh, distributing a lot of new scholarship and high-powered uh, knowledge uh, that are only to an elite, but as as those of us who have been at all on the even on the the edge of um, elite scholarly publication, this is all very difficult, very high risk stuff because you have a tiny market, very demanding authors, very demanding consumers uh, who all want the best but can't pay the prices for what are miserable circulations. Or in the in the seventeenth century. I mean, you, you have quite uh, an extensive European market for uh, scholarly work and fine books, uh, but of course, um, huge distribution problems. So uh, Cambridge and Oxford and the King's Printer and all of the, they're all teetering on the verge of bankruptcy year after year, whereas the English stock is turning out all this rubbish uh, or all this ephemeral publication uh, for which there, you know, almanacs are an annual thing. You need a new one and so every year so that you see what the phases of the moon are and how the crops are going to be and, and et cetera, et cetera, uh, and, and the prognostications for the coming, uh, for the coming year. I think, Gordon, you're, you're uh, uh, well, actually, Robin, of course, is absolutely right. And I think one of the other reasons the stock survives uh, um, and, and it's there all the way through to the present day is that the charitable element to it is, is, is actually a, 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 a key part of what it's there for um, and, it, and that's partly around welfare and partly around dividends for uh, uh, not just for you know wealthy stationers but also for their families when they die in, in the, um, and then also as Joe's work has pointed out the way in which that that ethos of ensuring that the poorer members of the community or of the stationers are able to benefit from the wealth that's generated from 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 the stock itself I think is also really important so it, it's it, it's a corporate uh, um, uh, 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 initiative in that sense it benefits uh, uh, the corporation as a whole rather than just simply uh, uh, individuals although it did benefit some individuals very well indeed. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the point that you're making that's coming over very powerfully is, of course, that this, this publishing uh, ventures uh, importance lies in these, uh, as it were, adjacent social and, and political uh, uh, benefits that flow from um, having uh, a, a dominant f uh, economic position in what is even in the seven, what in the 17th century even is a mass market, and that that continues throughout the uh, the 18th and the 19th century. Um, I, I see that the uh, the, the master has um, has um, made a point about uh, publishing almanacs. I mean, my uh, my understanding is that 
um, and I think uh, you'll be able to correct me if I've got this wrong, that the company, the, the English stock uh, until the 1770s paid uh, Oxford and Cambridge University presses not to publish almanacs. Uh, they weren't bothered about most of the other things uh, over the course of the time, but the almanacs were where the money was being made. And that the, the disaster for the, um, or the near disaster for the universities uh, in the two university presses in the 1770s was that um, the, the national legislation um, uh, really managed to release the, the English stock from paying the universities not to publish almanacs uh, and instead replaced that with um, a, a, a tax uh, that then the government paid to the universities not to publish um, almanacs, etc. And that went on, actually, the, the, the payment which was, so far as Cambridge was concerned, um, uh, was at a sort of miserable, I can't remember the exact figure, but something like £200 and a year. Uh, that came in to the university to for them not to publish uh, the almanacs um, and that uh, survived uh, I think into the 1970s 1980s um, even and then it was just quietly wound up as the as the government started to cut funding to higher education. <laughs> uh, yes just to just to clarify on the Oxford situation Oxford's almanac was the one exception to that rule. And that was because as, as any of you know about the University of Oxford Almanac, it is a extraordinary single sheet engraving uh, and, uh, and it clearly was not competing with the pocketbook uh, market that, uh, um, uh, that Helen and Richard uh, talked about. And so, but you're actually right, the, there was this annual payment uh, made in certain, it was made indirectly to the uh, the universities and so not directly from the stock but but via others um, but to forbear printing almanacs and um, certain school books as well yeah. Um, yeah. and and certain law books but the almanacs were the were, 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 was where the real money was um, and so so that's why Oxford was a, given that special exemption so in effect it was privileged in that way, um, but it was only to produce something that was very different from the uh, uh, um, the almanacs we've been discussing. Well, we're about to come to the, the end of our evening, but David Kirkby has uh, raised, this can be the last question put to uh, put to you all, um, that, that indicate, that, that asks how did stationers not possessing stock relate to the those members of the company who did because again the implication of what you've all been saying is that um, uh, the tremendous inequalities amongst stationers I mean within the company because those who owned stock formed an elite within the company um, and uh, in a corporate form um, and those who didn't possess stock I mean were the poor printers uh, the poor publishers and 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 so on who who simply um, who, who who simply lived from hand to mouth had very difficult time finding jobs and 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 so on and so that it it reveals um, uh, a hierarchy uh, w within the company uh, yes I, that that would be true although I think it, it's it depends and it changes over time and I think the uh, um, how it was at the very start is rather different from how it was at the uh, 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 in the um, 18th century. I mentioned that uh, in the 1770s the number of shares had increased to 229 but the the livery alone stood at over 300 so right. you know by definition you've got a very uh, um, small, a shrinking proportion of, 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 of possible shareholders. But in the early 17th century, I think there was, there was at least, it felt plausible that a, uh, a freeman entering the station's company in the early 17th century, it was plausible that they could, if they survived long enough and they made some good financial decisions, uh, they borrowed money perhaps, 
they could get onto the ladder. And uh, Joe, I, I, we haven't heard from you for a bit, so I just wondered whether you had any thoughts about looking at your wills, whether you can see a sense in that the, the, the ones who are bequeathing the stocks are doing so at the very end, you know, they are the elite or whether they are some more kind of ordinary stationers in that mix. Uh, yeah, it's interesting to think. I think it's hard to distinguish between some of the people who were, were elites for other reasons and, and were elites because they had stock. And, and I think the general sense is that, that you have both. I think if you're an elite, you have stock. And, and if you have stock, you're sort of moving into the elites. Um, and certainly when you look at the names listed um, of people who are wills I have, um, you know, we're looking at people who are masters and wardens and, and were, you know, were important people. Um, and part of that is because they were important enough to leave us a will, um, which does skew things. But I think generally that is the sense um, that, that this, and I think probably if you've got a lot of stock, you definitely want to leave it in a will. You know, a lot of the people uh, leaving stock are leaving the full amount. Um, so that's that's something to consider. Thank you. Helen, any thoughts? Particularly from the widow's perspective, because I think I think many uh, um, by the late 18th century, you had the sense that there were many uh, widows who were retiring uh, uh, to ha you know have very profitable retirements. But I think early on in the 17th century, I don't think that's quite quite the case. Uh, uh, um, but w what's your sense? Um, yes, I mean it's a really interesting question. I think in relation to the other hierarchies of the company as well, so the divisions between free men and apprentices, and the kinds of I suppose the, what you were saying, Ian, about the connection between um, the kind of aspirations that might keep people in check or might keep people's envy in check, um, and the kind of realities of day-to-day of -day life in the company. But I think one of the things I've always been really interested in, and which comes to you beautifully in Joe's research, is that really rich social network and the way in which stationers were constantly kind of creating and recreating those bonds and the lots of evidence that those were tested uh, <laughs> over and over again and that people were acting against them and people were um, rebelling particularly against patents, privileges and monopolies in the 17th century but also I think that sense of the stock as a, a kind of brilliant example of something which is at once thinking about profit but is also thinking in gen very genuine ways about community and sustaining the stationers as um, a group of people so I think it's a really interesting tension that comes through in terms of relationships which doesn't really answer David's question. Well, I, I, it, it does in a way, because I mean, it just shows what an incredibly complicated social organization the stationers company uh, is. I see that the master has joined us and the idea is that uh, he will wind the evening up and allow us to go to our, I hope not virtual, substantial buffets wherever we are in the world, master. Thank you so much, Gordon. Um, I'll try not to wind you up in the other sense that uh, might uh, make you go away feeling less relaxed. But first of all, thank you so much, all of you. And uh, I always think the archive evening is one of the highlights of the stationer's year. And we have an enormous uh, debt to, uh, oh, an enormous debt to Robin for her, her enthusiasm and getting it going in the first place. And it's so good that she's here this evening and contributed so such a lively way. Um, so thank you, first of all, then to, to Helen and to Joseph, to Richard and to Ian, and also to um, uh, Ruth for the, um, the excellent uh, um, virtual exhibition. Um, it's been a very rich evening. And I was just thinking, whenever you know, these things are brought together to be published, people always want to have a natty title for the book. It's a great weakness of our, our present civilization. But I thought about it. and. Here's a really forced one. You could call it w Women, Wills, Wealth and Weeks. Um, it is a pretty forced effort, but you can see that uh, this extraordinary collection of papers we've heard this evening brings together this amazing selection of uh, ways into this subject. And I think the other thing is that many of us knew quite a lot about um, one of the less attractive sides of the Stations Company, which was the sort of uh, monopoly side of things. And We've now begun to we've now been able to see a little bit more clearly how that originated and how it was prospered over the years. So thank you so much for yet another excellent archiving. Thank you, Gordon, for introducing it and also for being one of the current enthusers. Um, Marvellous to see you all.
And you never know, we might see published at some point within Will's Wealth and Weeks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.